Welcome to the forum at the Harvard School of Public Health. We're here to talk about delaying pregnancy and parenthood, the risks and rewards. A new report from the Centers for Disease Control confirms what we have all observed over the years. There are nine times as many first births to women 35 and older than there were in 1970. And the rate of first births to women in their 40s continues to grow. My name is Carol Hills, and I'm a senior producer and reporter at PRI's The World. And this event is a collaboration of the forum of PRI's The World and WGBH. The forum is a live webcasting series about health, health policy produced at the Harvard School of Public Health, which is celebrating its centennial year. We are live tweeting at forum HSPH and using the hashtag pregnancy delayed. During this presentation, we encourage you to email questions to our panelists. The, the email address is theforum at HSPH harvard.edu. Today's panelists, starting from my right, are Allison Earle. She's at the Heller School at Brandeis, and her specialty is focusing on how labor and social policies affect the health and well-being of families in the U.S., with a lot of comparisons to other countries around the world. Jeffrey Eckert is Director of Obstetri Obstetrical Clinical Research and Quality As Assurance at Mass General. His specialty is high-risk pregnancies. Marie McCormick is right here at the Harvard School of Public Health, and she's focused much of her research on low birth weight infants and their health outcomes. And Glenn Cohen is a professor at the Harvard Law School, and he is a bioethicist covering everything from uh, the fertility industry to medical tourism. Uh, today's program was inspired by a series that PRI of the World produced called The Ninth Month. They're stories about the final stages of pregnancy and childbirth around the world. In our forum today, it's going to last an hour, and we will first frame the societal and technological issues that are, uh, that are uh, encouraging women having births at an older age. And then we're going to switch to th the challenge of finding solutions, what's out there, and what may be down the pipeline for accommodating this trend that doesn't seem to be ending. We'll also take a look at, uh, we'll compare the U.S. health policies and U.S. family leave policies, also the policies that affect people's ability to raise children, and we'll look, we'll look at a cross kind of international focus on that. <clears throat> I just want to give you a sneak preview of that, though. It's interesting to think that um, the United States is only one of seven, seven countries around the world that does not have a paid leave for mothers after childbirth. That's not just industrialized nations, but the entire world. At the end of our, our discussion, we'll take questions from our studio audience and also our online audience. And we'll also see clips from a documentary that uh, was distributed by American Public Television called My Future Baby. And I thought we'd start with Professor Allison Earle. She's an expert on the intersection of policies and health outcomes. And Give us a sort of snapshot of what we're looking at in terms of the trend in women having first births at an older age. Sure, so thanks for having me. Um, as Carol said, uh, the recent report that came out of the uh, Centers for Disease Control found that uh, births to women 35 and older have increased ninefold, um, and that breaks down in terms of women giving birth at ages 35 to 39 when you look at the comparison from the early 70s um, to uh, 2012, those have increased sixfold. And then from women uh, giving birth at ages 40 to 44, it's increased fourfold. Uh, and these increases um, have happened um, across all racial groups. Uh, there are differences when you look at the uh, uh, rates of birth at older ages by race and ethnicity. So uh, there are higher rates among whites as compared to blacks somewhat significantly when you look at 35 to 39. The difference is something like 12 per, per 1,000 versus uh, 7 per 1,000 uh, for uh, uh, African Americans. So there are some variations, but the trend overall is increasing. And these trends in sort of the rise in the age at uh, the maternal age at first birth is seen globally. Um, again, you have to look at sort of differences by region. So in Africa and Asia, although the rates start lower, they've all increased over the last four decades. Um, there are a number of reasons that, um, that have been proposed and some of the research has found that's been driving these differences. 
Uh, and some of that they propose has to do with women's uh, increased um, opportunities to get education, choices to pursue their education for longer, um, and in addition, putting off uh, marriage and then putting off childbearing. Uh, the, other th the other sort of major factors um, has to do with sort of the technology and the uh, ability to have children um, at a much later age that previously um, really weren't available. Um, it's interesting, this is happening uh, sort of a, a around the world and I, I think I sort of originally focused, thought it was but mostly a U.S. phenomenon, it clearly isn't. And just briefly, what are the societal implications for this? Sure. Well, what happens w in general when women are having births um, at older ages is, although we have technology that helps them to have babies, uh, you know, up until much older ages, in general their fertility is lower. So there are going to be, in general, sort of fewer uh, births. And this has implications for the size of the population, but really for the composition of the population. So the percentage of the population at different ages really changes, and you're going to have many fewer at the younger and the working age, which has implications for when you're thinking about Social Security, both sort of the funding and how we're going to support um, older uh, older members of society uh, in terms of health care, who's going to be, you know, the family caregivers, who's going to be around to provide that, as well as just issues around sort of health care costs. So the potential implications for the trends, you know, are really significant. We're going to look at a clip now from My Future Baby that, that focuses in on a couple who wanted to wait to have a children, and now they're, they're uh, seeing some con consequences from that wait. Diana and Tim had been trying to get pregnant for about a year by the time they saw me, and that included two cycles of IVF in Austria. The decision to have kids, well, there was never a question. Yeah. We, we always wanted kids. I've been acting for most of my life, for 24 years. I've traveled everywhere. I've done movies. I've done TV series. So I feel like I don't need to accomplish anything professionally anymore. So I feel like I'm much more content and quiet to, to be at home and to, vo to devote myself completely to my child. And I think 10 years ago, it wouldn't have been the case. They spoke to me about the chance of having a baby. Her chance of having a birth at age 44 was only 3%. I've been healthy, I've worked out all my life, I don't drink, I don't, I don't smoke, I don't do drugs, I don't even drink coffee. I should get pregnant like this, you know, and you read in the press that this actress got pregnant at 45, this one at 40. We see cases of celebrities getting pregnant frequently from in vitro and some in their f late 40s and 50s. Um, and for the most part, those are donor eggs because the eggs are no longer viable. But the message to the lay public is, oh, I don't have to worry, I don't have to rush into it. Those myths can be very damaging when, in fact, the chance of a live birth at 45 is 1 to 2 percent. I thought, oh, my poor boyfriend, he's got a little problem here. After the blood test, the results came back. The doctor said, no, no, actually, it's you. Your hormone level is so low, you're not going to get pregnant naturally anymore. We did one IVF, it didn't work. Right away, I said, let's do one another one. And again, it didn't work. Every time when my test was negative, it's devastating. It's devastating. I want to turn to Jeff Ecker now. He's sort of on the front line in delivery rooms. Uh, he specializes in high-risk pregnancies. And what are you seeing in terms of the health implications or health risks for women having their first child at an older age? Well, a lot of this starts before the delivery room, of course. Um, to start, we should recognize that all of us, men and women, as we get older, accumulate things. And some of those things are medical conditions, and whether that's high blood pressure or diabetes or heart disease or arthritis, all of those things can affect a pregnancy. Separate from those issues, being older brings five or six things uh, that are different about a pregnancy. The first is one that Allison alluded to, difficulties in getting pregnant. The term we use for that is fecundity. And so in the early 30s, one can see in a kind of a clinical way the chances of getting pregnant decreasing. By the late 30s, it's more marked. And as you heard alluded to in the clip by the early and mid 40s, it's really quite unusual for someone to be able to get pregnant on their own. So that's one problem. The second issue is that once pregnant, losing a pregnancy and early loss, miscarriage is more common, probably for a host of reasons, some related to the health and, 
and um, biology of the egg itself, but others related to the health of the uterus and the uterine lining. Once pregnant, uh, medical complications of pregnancy are more common. Things like gestational diabetes, high blood pressure complicating pregnancy, and all of those things can require specific management and or lead to recommendations for early delivery. Caesarean delivery is more common as women get older. Now more common is a relative risk. The absolute risk remains not much different. And so I should emphasize that most women, regardless of age, should and will be able to have a, a vaginal delivery. But it's clear that as women get older, the chances of a caesarean section are slightly higher. Some of that's probably because of behaviors, the way doctors and patients themselves behave and choices they make. But some of it's probably the inherent biology of the uterus, which is, after all, a muscle. And like my muscles, all of our muscles as we get older, they maybe work a little differently. Finally, um, genetic conditions affecting a pregnancy can be more common as women get older. The most common such conditions are conditions in which there's an extra chromosome. Most of us have 46 chromosomes, 23 from mother, 23 from father. But there are some, other, some individuals that have 47. The most common such condition that we're all familiar with is Down syndrome, is which in which there's an extra chromosome 21. But there are other conditions in which there are extra chromosomes 13 and 18. So all of those things can complicate uh, pregnancy. Finally, and I imagine we'll be talking about a little later on in the discussion, as women get older, it's more common for them to turn to things like assisted reproductive technologies, whether that's stimulating the ovaries or using in vitro fertilization, those things all bring risks, risk related to multiple gestations and the consequences of that. So those are some of the medical things that someone like me thinks about. I was curious, we saw in this clip this couple, the woman says, you know, I really thought it would be easy. Do you, what are the common myths you encounter in, in the women you deal with or the couples about what they thought uh, about fertility and how easy it would be to get pregnant? Well, I think it's just that, that, that the media, whether we see a celebrity at, at 50 or someone else is pregnant, and, and what's missing from that story is that almost certainly they may be pregnant, but it's not their own eggs, so needing to access those technologies, and the, the difficulty in just conceiving in a single cycle. So some numbers, for example, in the early 30s, the chance of getting pregnant uh, in one menstrual cycle may be 15 to 25 percent. So not so bad. I don't know if that seems high or low to folks in the room. But as you reach the mid-40s, 44, 45, that's really down on the order of 1 or 2 percent or less. And so many times folks have planned and planned their lives and said, okay, at this age I'm going to be pregnant. It's true of young women uh, uh, as well. You know, I want to be pregnant now. I've planned it for it to be you know, this month or I'm ready, Not, it doesn't always happen that way, and much less likely as you get, as you get older. One, one qu uh, quick question for you, and then we'll, we'll move on, is um, I'm curious, you specialize in high-risk pregnancy. Have you noticed that it's dominant among women who uh, choose to have a child later, or is there no correlation or no sort of higher rate that you've seen? So older women are more likely to have for example, as I said, high blood pressure, other problems that make it a high-risk pregnancy. Look, the definition of high-risk is, is nebulous and will be defined differently by different patients and different hospitals and different um, physicians. But just being 35 or 40 or 45 in most places doesn't uh, give you the label of being a high-risk pregnancy. There's something else that goes along with it. And in many cases, I should emphasize that if you are pregnant and have a continuing pregnancy at 40, 44, 45, it should and will result in a healthy outcome. We're going to move to Marie McCormick now. She's focusing on the babies themselves. Uh, a lot of her research has been on uh, the impact of preterm babies and their health outcomes. Uh, Marie, you, you've done a lot of studies on that. What are you seeing of the preterm babies, or well, the babies that are uh, being born from the world? The first point I wanted to make is that when you look at the literature of outcomes of older women in the past, um, you're dealing with a totally different population, largely low income, often women who've had multiple, multiple children. So the, the, the group that Allison's talking about, the more well-educated, the more affluent, this isn't the group the, uh, that the older literature reflects. Um, what 
the issues are is that if you have a healthy term pregnancy, even if it's an IVF pregnancy, uh, the data suggests that uh, the children are perfectly healthy and that studies have done and looked at a broad array of both cognitive, behavioral, and physical outcomes and they're essentially normal. Where the problems come in are the problems he mentions in terms of the complications. Uh, things like gestational diabetes, hypertension uh, may lead to prematurity. Prematurity rates are high among multiple births, that is twins are higher, but they're also high among singleton births. It's higher up from the products of IVF. So the complications that you're seeing are either premature delivery or poorer fetal growth than you would expect, what is called uh, intrauterine growth restriction. And both of those conditions are associated um, with poorer outcomes. And it depends on the degree. If you deliver at 36 weeks, it's not so much a problem. You deliver at 27 weeks, uh, you're in for a greater risk of adverse outcomes. And those ad outcomes run the gamut. I, I mean, every time I read the literature, there are three, four more added to it. Uh, everything from cerebral palsy to intellectual disability, what used to be called mental retardation, um, to uh, motor incoordination, if you don't have that, uh, attention deficit disorder, a whole variety of respiratory problems like asthma. I mean, there's just an incredible list of things for which uh, premature babies are, are at risk. I want to emphasize, though, at risk. It's not a given, okay? Being 27 weeks doesn't condemn you to have asthma at age five. It's an elevated risk. It's probably about two to four times the risk of uh, a term baby, and it isn't a guarantee that you're going to have these complications. And the, other th and the other thing to mention um, is that these are also common problems of children. There are a lot of children out there with ADHD that were born term, a lot of children with asthma that were born term. So these are common problems, but at an elevated risk. I would also say that when you look at the outcomes of premature babies in particular overall, you're looking at a population that is often um, more heavily weighted to disadvantaged families, and that's because disadvantage increases the risk of prematurity. So we're not talking about disadvantaged families here. We're talking about preterm kids being born to families that are quite willing and able to support them. And the outcomes there are, are maybe, so the general literature may understate or overstate the adverse consequences of prematurity for these kinds of families. Uh, what about comparing the uh, children that are preterm from more economically disadvantaged to uh, those who have uh, advantages in terms of health outcomes down the road? Uh, do they do they reflect those advantages or disadvantages in terms of catching up or interventions? They, they reflect the advantages um, in the sense that um, a, if you compare a preterm child from an advantaged family to a disadvantaged family, uh, clearly the, the preterm child from the advantaged family does better, but they're still more vulnerable to some of these consequences in terms of having either uh, some developmental delay, delayed speech, things of this sort, and even in vantage families would, would encounter those kinds of vulnerabilities. One quick question. Uh, in recent years, we've seen some studies that somehow uh, fathers, uh, older fathers, there's some health consequences to children uh, born to women who are with fathers who are her older. Any evidence that you've seen of that? Any Not idea? independent of the factors of prematurity, which outweigh that considerably. Now we're going to look at uh, uh, another clip from My Future Baby about a young lawyer who cho chose to freeze her eggs. Egg freezing was originally developed for cancer patients, but as the technology has improved, more and more healthy women are using it to delay childbearing. There are a lot of advantages and rewards to being an attorney, but on the way up, there also are a lot of dues to pay. and. I think for some women that means putting off having children. I knew essentially that my fertility clock was ticking. I knew that at 32 or 33 years old, I might be approaching the last good years of fertility in my life. Egg freezing has a potential to lead a social revolution. You know, the baby question is always coming up in courtship and in relationships. Um, and women make a lot of decisions about their professional and personal uh, goals in life based on a baby. I know that I want a committed marriage with somebody who's going to be a good father and a good husband. The actual medical risks with egg freezing are quite minimal. 
And you know, it really is a viable option for a lot of women. It does give them a chance to have a baby in the future. My concern is that it's just that. It's a, it's a chance, it's not a guarantee. And I worry that some women uh, consider it more of a guarantee and might make decisions in life with that in mind. We're going to Glenn Cohen now. Um, Glenn, we've got this new technology, we've got these ways to delay childbirth. What are the bioethical considerations that you, that you research and write about? So let me put it provocatively. This is graduation month in Boston. Imagine the new standard graduation gift to women is uh, uh, money to get your eggs frozen. Could happen. 10000 to 20000 dollars what we're talking about. Some families certainly would be willing to invest that. Would that be a good thing or a bad thing for our society? So what's the good side? As we heard, women like this young woman on the partnership track or the tenure <coughs> track, I might say, have the option of delaying uh, uh, parenthood in a way that can allow them to be better parents in their older, more resourced parents, and also achieve other life goals. Indeed, if you look at the dominant marriage strategy in 1980, it was for men to delay their parenthood and then marry and impregnate younger women. Now, in the 2010s, we actually have a more gender equitable strategy where both partners can invest in themselves and delay. So those are the positive sides of this. Uh, the negative side is that the movement in workplace law and in workplace culture has begun to build workplaces that enable women to have children and still work and produce their career. If every other woman who's trying to get a partner at her law firm uh, knows that they will be judged against her who delayed it, is that a pressure, is that a pressure against workplace accommodation? Moreover, many women may freeze their eggs, and there are some health risks of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, for example, low, but, but, but there, uh, also the expense involved, and end up not needing to use those eggs. Will we see a secondary market, an egg sale of frozen eggs, right? Once you've uh, made these eggs and you don't use them, you'll, you'll sell them. Finally, I would say, uh, who gets access to this technology? So delayed parenthood is really a middle class strategy, right? Especially if it's involving egg freezing. Unwanted pregnancies, uh, earlier age of marriage, earlier age of first child, much more common among a low socioeconomic statuses. And what essentially this happens to do is it reproduces hierarchy. The wealthy can wait, the wealthy can invest in their children, invest in their careers, and the hierarchy can be maintained and they can invest in those children. In a society like ours where IVF is not covered in most states, Massachusetts is an exception where uh, some insurers require it to be covered based on state law, uh, it is the case that we have access. But in a world where that access is differentially available, is this technology really going to be, in fact, reinforcing hierarchy and inequality? And I guess I'm also curious, um, I'm also curious about to the degree or which people delaying uh, having their first child then have the eggs, are they, whose eggs are they getting typically? Are they other educated people prolonging? Is there sort of a market for uh, the eggs of disadvantaged people who are making their eggs available? So right now the egg market is handled as a brokerage essentially. Fascinating difference between sperm banks and egg brokerages. Sperm bank is like employment. You go in, you mm -hmm. put it in the cup, and you only get paid if your sperm actually passes. Egg brokerage is a very different affair, right? You meet the couple, you're giving mm -hmm. the gift of life, and often these women are being recruited from college campuses across the, the world, especially high-performing ones. So there's definitely a strong, in both markets, a strong eugenic push to have a certain kind. But in general, in the current egg market, fresh eggs are preferred, therefore younger women. In a world where egg freezing becomes much more routine, you might have a more robust supply of eggs available for using someone else's donor eggs. And I know you've written about this in terms of the impact of um, IVF and other uh, reproductive technology on the choice for couples to adopt. Is there any correlation? Is it, is it uh, influencing that decision one way or the other? Yeah, so one thing you might say is that this technology is, has a terrible reinforcement of genetic essentialism, this view that what matters is that you are my kin, my blood, right, which everything that carries forward, and we're worried about crowding out adoption. The research I've done, econometric research, has looked to see states where insurers must carry IVF coverage does adoption rates go down? We found no evidence that adoption actually goes down either domestically or internationally in the work we've done. But that's been mostly about IVF. In the new world of egg freezing, it may be a different matter. 
And just one other quick thing. I think you mentioned in one of your articles that Quebec and Israel are one of two places that actually have IVF as part of their uh, universal health coverage. Yeah, the province of Quebec has recently uh, made IVF uh, basically standard coverage experimentally, and Israel has a very pronatalist policy. Actually, even lesbians in Israel, I believe, can get coverage of IVF uh, and the like, which is interesting. The effect here, one interesting thing, we heard a little bit about multiple pregnancies. They're extremely costly for the system, and there's some research that shows that if you subsidize in vitro fertilization through insurance coverage, the number of multiples go down because you're not paying out of pocket, so you have less of an incentive to do multiple implantation, which might be good. And in fact, there's some estimates that Quebec will save money on the neonatological side by covering IVF on this side, but it's only about two or three years into the experiment, so they don't have enough data to be able to say. Now, we've just been spending uh, uh, some time talking about kind of the challenges of health and uh, ethical. We want to switch now to looking at sort of policy recommendations and solutions and, and maybe ask even the question is, um, should we just accept that women are going to have um, babies in their 40s and this is just the way it is and we need to accommodate that. Um, and we're going to look at our third clip from My Future Baby. If I were to give another person that was looking to go down this road advice, I would definitely say, for me, go for it. But also get your finances in, in order because um, it, what I found is it really takes a village to take care of, especially two kids, but even one kid, I believe. It takes a lot of support and help, and it would have been really helpful if I had the capacity to have some, uh, have, have a nanny or have some additional support other than my, my friends and family, because it can be a strain. But as far as making that choice, you know, for me it was not a matter of if, it was when, and, and so my desire to have children was if I wasn't going to be able to do it naturally, um, I, would do, I would do whatever it took. And if, it, if I couldn't get pregnant somehow, I would adopt. I mean, it was always, it was, it was never an option not to have kids for me. So um, if that's really somebody's desire, then I say this is absolutely the best thing that, that they could do. And it's been a really amazing journey. It's been difficult, but well worth it. It's just been really phenomenal. We're going to go to Allison Earl to start off our discussion on solutions and what's going on. You, you've spent a lot of time looking around the world. Uh, how does the U.S. compare and what countries are, are doing the most to support parents of any age? Sure. Well, and I wanted to just uh, sort of follow up on one other point um, on the issue of delayed parenting being a more middle class um, and really a more white uh, problem and just say that's also reflected globally. So when you look at um, sort of the mean age at first birth by region of the country um, and there's a great um, uh, sort of interactive uh, graph you can look at on PRI where they've looked at mean age at birth in almost every country and you can see as you scroll across you can see the, the age at first birth is highlighted as you're going from younger to older, and it's very much a north-south pattern. So looking at uh, countries in Africa, um, some in Asia, and some in Latin America, very much on the early, you know, their mean age at first birth is much younger. Um, and then as you get up towards Europe, then you're way into, you know, you go from you know, countries where it's, you know, 18, 19, you know, in Africa, all the way up to Germany and Switzerland where it's over 30. Um, so these issues in terms of how they're affecting different groups of people um, globally. Um, in terms of policies, um, and, and I know Marie can talk some about um, some early intervention and, and, and policies when you're dealing with the children very specifically. Um, in terms of the workplace, so you've got a set of parents who've taken the time to invest in their careers. Um, spend, you know, I can, I've, I've done that myself and uh, have two kids, but w delayed parenting myself and was faced with these, these, these issues of how to manage work and family together. My children, fortunately, um, 
you know, develop typically. I didn't have any extra issues. And the challenges are very difficult in the United States where, um, as Carol started off, uh, there is no paid maternity leave as a federal policy. Um, there are a handful of states that have taken the lead and um, provided paid leave. Uh, the maximum, you know, when you look at California, where it's been um, around for um, just about 10 years, and it's six weeks. So uh, six weeks is pretty early to contemplate coming back and their whole set of risks for the mother and the child for doing that. And that compares, um, the, so that's the best policy in the U.S., and that compares absolutely. to the norm in um, most of Europe and other parts of the country, which are months, if not some common cases, a couple absolutely, of years. So absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, over 180 countries have some form of paid leave for new mothers, um, and that's either through maternity leave. There's been a real shift toward parental leave. Um, many fewer countries have paternity leave, leave that's specifically for the dad. That's only about 84 countries. But it's also important on a global level to note that about half of the countries that do have leave for new mothers only have leave, they have leave for less than 14 weeks, is what, which is what the International Labor Organization uh, recommends. And that's much lower um, than the amount of time that the WHO, and if you look at the United States, that's recommended for mothers to breastfeed. And the other really important thing that um, you know, paid maternity leave is linked with is increased initiation and duration of breastfeeding, which has a whole series of um, really important benefits for um, children. The other sort of policy that um, that's important to uh, to support parents, especially parents whose children have any sort of health issues, is some very short-term leave for children's health, um, and then for children's education, which we could you know wouldn't even bring up in this country. That seems like um, to uh, pie in the sky. Um, but there are about 80, uh, 76 countries that have um, some form of leave that can be used for children's health. Um, the United States doesn't. Uh, if everybody's familiar with the Family and Medical Leave Act, one, it only covers uh, just over 50% of um, working adults in this country. It's unpaid. Uh, the health conditions that are covered have to be serious, like hospitalizations. Um, so it leaves out a whole slew of, um, of the population, really, relative to other countries. Um, you know, doesn't, doesn't recognize the needs of all working parents and people who are caring for somebody, let alone parents who've delayed and have any additional um, you know, risks for the mother or the child. Jeffrey Ecker, what are you seeing in terms of what's working and what's not in, in your area of expertise? And also, I encourage the other panelists to uh, jump in. Um, well, we talked about age of first child and across the globe, and Massachusetts has led the way in, in, in this country. The average age of having a first child crossed 30, boy, about a decade ago here, and so not uncommon, not uncommon in these parts. Um, I think that um, what's most important, what we're only seeing a little of, is getting some of this information out there programs like this, the internet can help with that, but there needs to be more of the reality of what getting pregnant is like in a so a, a, debunking a, the myths available and debunking having people recognize. Debunking the myths. Yeah. I think that's very important. It's very, it's a difficult conversation when I see folks in advance of pregnancy who have delayed having a child and they're hearing this for the first time from me. As you imagine, it can be in some ways quite disappointing. I think it's also important to point to the fact that technology, at least at present, doesn't and isn't going to solve all of this. Um, in vitro fertilization, egg freezing are possibilities. They don't work in every case. Um, you know, we talk about egg freezing in particular as though it's something and that's, that's right there and, and, and perfect. And it really is the last year or two that it's been termed a non-experimental therapy and, ex and accepted as more of a routine thing. But but even in that case, it's by no means a guarantee you freeze your eggs, you come back in five or ten years, and no problem 
um, getting pregnant. If I can uh, jump in on just on that point, I think what's interesting is that the fertility uh, industry has misaligned incentives here, right? And that many of them have ways of representing the odds. Some of them actually have deals where they tell you, you know, if you go four times and it doesn't work, the fifth one will be free. They play on things like the gambler's fallacy. Wow. Uh, and again, the CDC requires reporting of their success rates, but there's all sorts of decisions that go into who they'll see and how they, you know, selection they there. So I do think that, you know, as the good doctor says, uh, it's only recently been labeled by the American Society of Reproductive Medicine as non-experimental, and really only in the context of oncofertility, of cancer. Even today, as a way of delaying pregnancy, I think it's considered by most still to be experimental, costly, and health concerns. But the fertility industry, I'm, you know, I'm a capitalist. I don't mind that people try to make money, and I give them, you know, uh, the power to do so. But they have no incentive to educate women about what the real uh, success rates and chances so are. I, I'll return to what I said before: information, and I don't disagree. Accurate information that everyone can understand and digest is important. Um, with regards to IVF, a little separate from what we're talking about here, but something I think that will resonate with with Marie is that we can do more about how we control or regulate the number of embryos that are returned in any one given cycle. So Glenn alluded to it, it's important to emphasize. So why does covering IVF reduce the risk of multiple gestations and prematurity? Well, in any one cycle, the number that your chances of having twins, triplets, and beyond increases with the number of embryos returned. If you're paying for it, cheap would be 10,000 bucks a, a cycle. If you're paying for it, there's kind of this perverse incentive to say, I want more embryos back. Mm -hmm. If there's coverage for it, it's more reasonable to say, gosh, let's stop with one. Maybe I'll have to come back for another cycle, but the chances of twins in prematurity are much, much lower. And in that regard, it's important, again, to contrast this country with places abroad. So you look to Britain, national health coverage for things like that, and the number of embryos returned is regulated. If you want to return more than one or two embryos in a cycle, you have to argue and justify why that's the case. Not, not the case here um, in this country where it's really a, a product in many states that's bought and is consumer driven. So in terms of a policy that many older women access that will affect things like prematurity, increased use of elective single embryo transfer is going to be really high on my list. Marie McCormick, where do you think the research and funding is needed to uh, better ensure healthy outcomes for, uh, for the babies born? Once they're born. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we have very, very strong experimental evidence that having intensive preschool programs improves the outcomes of premature infants. Full disclosure, it was a study I participated in. Um, but. Having said that, I think if you were to say where the research needs to be is in taking findings like that to scale so that they are available in large to large segments of the community. The support out there for parents of premature infants and infants with other kinds of health and developmental problems um, is uh, spotty to say the least. Uh, the major program is early intervention, which is basically the downward extension of zero to three of special education services for children who are at risk uh, or have uh, developmental problems. And many very premature infants would be automatically referred to early intervention because they, they qualify. Otherwise, you have to develop a developmental problem and then get referred into once, you, once this uh, kicks in. And you know, then there are all sorts of other preschool programs and home visiting programs, uh, many of which are actually aimed at disadvantaged families and not these more advantaged families, uh, even though you can hear mothers saying, gee, I wish I had them because they, they would like that kind of support in terms of home visiting nurses and people to help them work with their children. Um, the programs, even early intervention, which is a federally mandated program, the criteria and eligibility criteria vary from state to state. Um, other kinds of programs, they vary from program to program, so it's a very hodgepodge kind of uh, system. And I, I promise that if I would talk in my ideal world, uh, my ideal world would have uh, a universal preschool programming, beginning with home visits um, to the nurse for every family, regardless of, of their age or whatever, um, followed by availability of preschool kinds of settings that foster development. Again, like lots of other things, other countries do this. You know, this is not this is not magic. 
other countries do this. We just do not seem to be able to get the political will. And, and the reason for that is simple. One, you may be able to prevent problems from emerging with good preschool programming, <coughs> but you have a platform that if these problems emerge, there's a professional there that can detect them and help and bring in remedial services pretty promptly, just as they do in the school mm -hmm. system where they, <coughs> they're monitoring this kind of progress. Um, so that, in my ideal world, would be everyone to have a good support for mothers of single mothers of twins um, for, for every family. We're going to go to questions in a minute, but I just want to ask one more question uh, to anyone on the panel, which is, are we just going to accept the fact that women are going to have uh, babies, first babies in their 40s, and that this is just the way it is, and we're going to accommodate it by policy and technology? Or does anybody think that there's, our, there's questions about, is it, do we just sort of accept that this is it and we accommodate it? Or does anybody foresee a pushback that in future generations they'll look at their tired and haggard parents <laughs> and say, maybe we'll rethink this? Because in some ways we're sort of accommodating something that should we be accommodating it? And one thing is that you're talking about a world without grandparents, essentially, right? If a woman is 40 when she has her first child, she's 61 at her child's graduation, right? And essentially, she's unlikely to be around much into her grandchild's life. And that's a profoundly different world than many of us live in. If we went through the history of the world, of course, there's period when we look at longevity, where we probably were in a situation more like that. I mean, for me, I certainly don't want to stand in the way of people who want to make a particular choice about their reproduction. That's sacrosanct. But, you know, even if we do accommodate this, I really do think it's important to emphasize that we're talking about a portion, a slice of the American populace that will do this. And what we're really going to have is two reproductive Americas, not a uniform reproductive, really probably more like seven or eight reproductive Americas. Any other but quick comments? I mean, I think the, the reason, at least, and, and this is what I had said before, is that you have a more well-educated um, set of parents or a parent or mother, you know, deciding to have a child, deciding, you know, it, it's a choice, but it's somewhat forced on her. And part of this is because, like, um, whether it's in um, law and you're trying to make partner, whether it's in academia and you're trying to get tenure, whether you're in medicine and you're trying to really establish yourself, all those things are happening. There's like five to seven years that are like the prime, um, you know, they're a little after, I would say, probably you're even more fertile, but slightly before that, but during years when you're, you know, it's much easier to get pregnant. And so I think, you know, there are few alternatives, and the people who have spent more time in academia can say this, where, you know, what about thinking about not, uh, about adjustments to, you know, the tenure clock, thinking about h how to make it more possible, you know, to have that, you know, full career without consequences, you know, not be put on, you know, a mommy track, but to have both. And it's not, you know, men and women in those, you know, couples might be, you know, happier. Um, doing that, so I, um, I'm not. I, it's in terms of what's going to happen to make that change. You have to have, you know, enough people who are at the higher, you know, echelons of all those different industries and fields. You know, decide this is something that they want to change. And I, that's a, you know, that's a big. Uh, Apropos <laughs> of Dr. Ecker's comments, though, I think there needs to be some more information out there. Oh. Uh, when you see. A 47, 48-year-old mother, as we see them in the clinic, chasing toddler twins. Um, there's a lot of energy that goes into this, and I think the health consequences, even of some of the complications of pregnancy that he's talking about, um, eclampsia, preeclampsia raises your risk of hypertensive disease and cardiovascular disease later on. And so I think that not only is it the policy end, but also some of the real down-to-earth health implications of this. and and the energy implications need to be. Absolutely, and I think this goes back to what you know, Glenn was saying, which is like, I wish somebody had said something to me about like, about the need and how great it is to have grandparents who are around, you know, to help you and how tired you're gonna feel, you know, at 55 when your kids are, you know, 15 and they're drinking, you know, who knows what they're doing, but you, I'm telling you, like, you wish you had the energy that you would have had at, you know, you know, 35. It's Maybe very just different. Be asleep in oblivious or just like, like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, we're going to open it up to questions from our in-studio and online audience. My first child was born when I was 40. My second child when I was 44. Uh, 
The first child weighed seven pounds and three ounces. The second, seven pounds and 10 ounces. I had great pregnancies, great deliveries. One was born at home because uh, I quite didn't make it by the paramedics' help and I did lots of <laughs> yoga and before that. So, and I have an academic career here, here at Harvard and I have a problem. After at the age of 44, I had my second kid and the age of 46, I wanted more. And then I had two miscarriages. And what I'm saying now is that in my next life, I'm going to start at the age of 18, and then I can have 12 children because the best thing I've ever done in my life are my children. Now, my kid, one kid got married at the age of 32 last year, and I plan to be a grandmother, so there will be children with grandmother. My grandmother had a child with no help at the age of 52, so there is a genetic component. Um, the other thing, my question is, I have a very close friend in New York who gave the first birth of twins with reproductive technology at the age of 56, but she lied that she was in her 40s because there, a, there is an age limit. And the question is, should there be an age limit? Um, Let's ask it. Yeah, so, so let me just answer that piece first. So in the US, there is no law that says you have to do uh, past this age, no go. Other parts of the world, there are those laws. But then there is the practice of the individual fertility doctors. They may face malpractice liability. They also face regulation by the American Society of Reproductive Medicine. And then they're also worried about their market share, right, and that your numbers go into their CDC reporting, and they may have an incentive uh, not to take you as uh, a patient. So, but you know, as a legal matter, there's no law that would prohibit an individual uh, fertility doctor who is willing to see you to impregnate you at 56. Some people think there should be. I, I don't, I'm not one of them, but that is very different from the rest of the developed world where many of the places do have age limitations. Another question from the studio. If I can, just offer some from online here because we have a lot of people emailing and uh, tweeting as well. So uh, this is from the senior editor of Boston Magazine, Janelle Nanos. It's an interesting question. As the self-tracking phenomenon has become more popular, a number of new apps and devices are being developed to help would-be parents monitor their ovulation cycles or the development of their unborn child. The local app developer Ovuline, for example, claims to have had in hand 50,000 conceptions over the past year or so. I wonder what the panelists think the impact of big data will have on pregnancy and what we know about maternal health in the next few years. Any Anyone thoughts on big that? data? It's a lot of college tuition <laughs> lines on the hook right. for, right? You know? I, mean, I will say that to the extent that these are giving medical advice, there's actually going to be very interesting questions about when uh, it ends up actually requiring regulation by the FDA, for example, and the validity of what it's doing in an advising function. That's they one also thing. say conception, not whether it's brought to term. Right. I mean, it, it's tough to know. I haven't seen the, the apps and the technology, mm -hmm. but it, uh, what one imagines keeping track of cycles and even ovulation by temperature, a lot of that would be possible with a pen and a paper. So I'm not sure what the, <laughs> what the interface is, is, is really doing there. It's, it seems unlikely that it's you know, actually monitoring your, your ovulation and your hormones directly. But I mean, the level of individuation you get. So you can tell a woman with this demographic, right? We have 100,000 women across the world of exactly this way, exactly this age, and mix in some genetic information about them. The kind of predictive analytics you might be able to harness with big data would, I think, be very interesting. And maybe it turns out it doesn't get you much. But certainly yeah. we know a lot more at the individual patient level than we probably do today. So it's a lot of information, but it needs to be distilled down into reality. And again, it goes back to communicating about what the real chances are of getting pregnant, period. And um, what's, how about another question? Great. Um, we, I'll just take some from Twitter. Does the prolonged use of the birth control pill improve chances for easy pregnancy at advanced age? I don't think using um, birth control pills meaningfully affects your chances of getting pregnant in either direction. Now, if you're taking 
oral contraceptives, so that the hormones are there to giving you a regular cycle, you may find that when you stop taking them, your underlying ovarian function, your underlying cycle isn't there anymore, and it may have masked that going away, but it's not going to make it happen in either direction. Great, I'll just take one more here because I try to group them by the number of questions we have on the same topic. What is the maximum number of IVF cycles that a woman can undergo to try to conceive? I think the answer is as many as the fertility doctor will give you, essentially. At some point, many of them will say, this is not working, and they have incentives to cut you off at some point, but it's a money game. I don't know so if you ever want to I would have said, yes, it's your bank account. Can <laughs> <laughs> there's there's I, no regulation I, at all. I, I don't mean to be cynical. No, there isn't. There's not. By law, there's no regulation subject. In fact, the U.S. is one of the least regulated reproductive technology markets. The one federal law on the subject pertains to requiring you to report. That's essentially your, your data about how you do. That's more or less it in terms of reproductive technology at the federal level in but, the United States. But does it come down, what about the state level, say Massachusetts, where IVF is covered, does it only cover a certain yes. number of chances? Yes, so IVF so has limitations. We're pretty generous out. compared to many other states in terms of what we cover. And then there's also malpractice liability and fraud and the like and tort law that might do some of the work. But for the most part, and actually there'd be interesting questions if someone tried to limit this, the number of IVF, whether you'd violate your constitutional rights to procreate, and we'd have an interesting conversation uh, about this in the United States. And I should just say there are a lot of questions coming in about the laws around uh, what is covered and what is not. Um, and what states it's covered in. Can so I've got a good article. I can put it up on your website afterwards. Great. It has a good grid, <laughs> which will tell you what the insurance status is state by state. But uh, there's only about four country, four states that do uh, cover IVF, isn't that true? More than that, although some of them are complete. There's probably more like 11 or 12 have some level of coverage. Some are though what's known like Texas is a mandate to offer state, which requires insurers to offer employers IVF coverage, but doesn't require the employer to adopt a plan like that. And the other thing is that self-insured companies get out of all of this regulation, and most of major states are in self-insured employers. Harvard covers IVF, which is good, even though it's not required to do so uh, by uh, state law because it's self-insured. Thank you. Some questions from, th from the audience. Yes. Yes, uh, once we, um, my name's Andy from the Center for Health Communication here. I have a question of just practicality. One, uh, uh, as long as the lights stay on, can you keep these eggs in the freezer for as long as you need them? And from a health perspective, uh, if, um, if they, because this technology came from cancer, I believe, you know, getting this, freezing the eggs and such, um, if you were to use um, a donor uterus, I don't know, a vessel, if you will, if it's the, the husband's uh, sperm and the wife's frozen eggs that she put on ice after she graduated from BU. Is that child biologically 100% theirs? You know, uh, you hear about having, uh, you know, all the things with cesarean sections, um, a vaginal birth, you know, I've seen a lot of things that that's important to certain aspects of, uh, you know, development or whatever. I don't know if that's uh, something you guys can speak on and I realize this is a lot to say, but. Is that a child? Is that child biologically theirs? Um, and uh, that's from a non-medical perspective. So bear with me. Thanks. So two quick things uh, on this. The first is, and I'll, I'll be corrected. So there is a reduction in your chance of conceiving with frozen eggs versus fresh eggs. I'm not sure there's any evidence that actually the longer they stay frozen, you know, they have like a best before day. My impression <laughs> is that the big cutoff is fresh versus frozen, not the length of freezing. There are cases involving what happens when you get divorced, mostly with frozen embryos, when you put the two together and then froze the embryos. There are also famous cases about uh, embryo switches, so a black couple that gets the white couple's uh, embryo and the white couple gets the black, and do you unspool it on the back end, or do who keeps what, even though they were gestational carriers. So this can get pretty complicated pretty fast. But for the most part, in almost every state, if you're both of you are the genetic parents of the child, uh, for the most part, if you use, well, I should say for every state. In California, for example, if the, the carrier can sign a contract, and that contract will be enforced. Now, when the carrier is also a genetic mother, things get more complicated. And it varies state by state what the law is. But in many states, you can use contract and other tr tools to try to mitigate some of those risks. What has happened in cases of divorce where it's contested? 
So in most of the cases, the holding is that you cannot, the party that wants to use the uh, free embryos, usually the woman, uh, cannot use it if the other party, the man, objects. Even if it's part of the consent process, they signed an agreement where they said that in the event we get divorced, my wife will get the embryos. This is the law in the U.S. Elsewhere in the world, the EU and Israel have had cases that are quite tragic involving women who froze embryos in anticipation of cancer treatment and now want them, and they're not going to be able to have any children at all. And the EU and Israel has taken different positions than we have. But egg freezing may also change this as well, and that you might choose to inseminate some of the eggs and freeze the embryos, but then freeze a few of your eggs too. Just don't tell your husband, it's because you think you're going to get divorced in a few years. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I think it was interesting that Ms. Earl mentioned what, would it, what a society would look like if the race to become partner or to develop your career wasn't during the most fertile time of a woman's life. And I think perhaps each one of you could speak to it, what would it take to just offset that clock instead of making it more when will I, can I, why can't it be I can make partner any time once I dedicate myself, I can dedicate my career later, I mean, what are the steps or is it possible to have a world in which the thing that doesn't impact us biologically is not the thing that keeps us from being able to make that choice? I don't know if anybody else wants to comment, but um, the um, setting I'm most familiar with, and not really intimately, but is looking at academia, and that's the place where um, there have been some, uh, there has been movement to try and sort of figure out a way to balance that need to make tenure, you know, with um, with having children and how you can sort of extend that tenure clock and. My sense is that's come about sort of as women have um, not to my liking, you know, quite enough, but risen, you know, in the ranks, you know, within that particular field and have become, you know, have both those who've sort of struggled with it and have had, you know, you need to have somebody who's in a, you know, position of power to sort of carry that, you know, your, um, your proposal for how to do it and to support you. So I think there has to be some, um, someone who can relate to and understand, you know, the challenge of doing that um, in a position to try and make change. But I don't know what you're in, in medicine, if you are in law or anywhere else you have, have seen changes and how those have come about? Increasingly, I think, are recognizing that people come to careers at different points and at different mm -hmm. speeds and allowing for people to exit and re-enter and delay. It's going to take a long time for that to be the, the, the common model. But I think there's a lot more, more tolerance of it, and just tolerance of, of families. I mean, some of it's women delaying um, or, or, you know, stepping off for a year or two and coming back in. Look at my field, obstetrics and gynecology, right? Increasingly, my colleagues are women. And so now we're learning as a field that, boy, someone's going to go away for three or four years and come back or they're going to disappear and they'll work half time. And how do we accommodate malpractice insurance and practices to allow that to happen? And what's changed is exactly what you say. There are more, more women and that's going, to, that's going to drive change. It also should be equitable for men as well so that they have the opportunity to step out. And I think the other thing, but apropos of my comments, is having supports on site having childcare on site, having access to supports on site so that you don't have to leave the office immediately at 5.05 because the, the daycare worker is, is, you know, closing her door. So, I, you know, I think some of the thoughts of having family supports on site is also an important strategy. Support for breastfeeding on site, yeah, very important. We have time for one more question. I do just want to take this one last question from online because we've had uh, viewers from Africa and we have a question from the WHO. Um, which is about uh, people in the developing world and the risks that they face from delaying pregnancy. And the WHO question ends by saying, how will finding and solving delayed childbearing issues within high resource settings help couples in lower resource settings? Are there things that we can learn from what's happening here? 
My sense is the kinds of causes of infertility we're talking about, at least among the population that's intentionally delaying pregnancy, is quite different from the cost, the causes of infertility in those populations. But uh, I stand to be corrected by the others, including the public health experts on the <laughs> panel. I would guess that that's probably more the situation that we saw 30 years ago in terms of people having either severe sub subfertility uh, or other problems in getting pregnant um, in terms of th it's really a very different picture than what we're seeing. Thank you. Well, our forum has come to an end, but you can continue the conversation at forumhsph.org or pri.org slash ninth month. I want to thank all our panelists and the audience for being here. And tune in here, t tune in tomorrow for another forum event. It's called Pesticides and Food, Eating Safely and Sustainably. And that's at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you so much. <laughs>